Our subject for today, the cause of war. The cause of war. God spake all these words saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and shewing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. I'm grateful to God for this privilege, and it is a privilege to be with you again. This is the third day of the five-day revival, and I'm grateful to God for the gift of life, the gift of a clear mind, the tremendous gift of knowing Jesus Christ, and as I said earlier, the privilege of speaking to you about eternal things as they are recorded in the Holy Word of God. Thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. I particularly welcome anyone who is not a Seventh-day Adventist. Thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. And I ask God very directly to grant you a very, very special blessing and your children so that you may be induced by the goodness of God to come back and be with us tomorrow and be with us on Thursday. I welcome little boys and little girls who are listening. God bless you. Perhaps you're eight or nine or 10 or six or five. Jesus was all those ages and he was a very godly child and you can be a godly child. So thank you very much for listening, my little brother and my little sister. And as you listen and in your mind, you understand what I'm saying. I want you to say quietly, Lord, help me to obey you. Help me to be a little child that makes you proud. May the Lord bless the host church, particularly bless the host country of India, and bless all countries represented by those who are listening. Our subject for today, the cause of war. The cause of war. Before I get into that message, as always, I ask you as your brother in Christ, preserve reverence where you are. Be conscious of the fact that the God of heaven and earth is present among you, in the person of his Holy Spirit, and he deserves our finest reverence. So please preserve reverence where you are. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Jeremiah chapter one, verse nine, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. Consider those words, the Lord, that's the almighty God, the sinless God, put forth his hand and touch my weak mouth. And the Lord said unto me, behold, I, that's God, divine, have put my words, that's divine, in thy mouth, that's earthly, that's flesh, 
that's dirt, that's the earth. And I thank God for that confidence and for that assurance. Ask God to do that as I speak. Favor number three, think as you listen. Use this. That's why God gave it to you. Think. Isaiah 1.18, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. The fact that you serve God and God is all powerful does not relieve you and me of the responsibility of thinking. If people would stop and really, really think, they might not smoke, they might not drink alcohol, they might not take drugs. If they were to stop and think, they might not be disrespectful to their parents. What am I doing? Stop and think. Come now, says God, let us reason together. Our subject, the cause of war. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I come to you as I came yesterday and the day before for this revival session. And I ask you to God, first of all, accept my thanks for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your protection. And thank you to God for extending to me this great privilege of speaking for you. If I've offended you, forgive me, I pray. Cleanse me by applying the blood of your son, which is the life of your son. Remove every spot, every stain, not for my sake, dear God, but that I might be a clean vessel in your hand, that you may be properly glorified and your people blessed. And as I mention your people, bless them right now as I speak, dear God. Remember the guests, those who are not set with the Adventists, who are listening. Bless them in a very, very special way and their children. And Father, for those who have COVID-19, I ask you now in the name of Jesus, the name of the one who healed everyone who came to him, touch them, Father, and remove that affliction, I pray. But not only COVID-19, if anyone listening is sick, dear God, or if anyone listening has a sick family member, touch that person in mercy, dear God, because the Bible says of you, you delight in mercy. Touch the person and bring them healing and relief. Now, Father, bless India, that mighty democracy. Bless the leaders of that country, dear God. Remind them in your own way that righteousness or right doing exalteth a nation. But remind those of us listening that righteousness also exalts the individual. Bless every country represented by the audience, I pray, please. And help me, Father, to make this message so simple that a child will understand. I pray from my heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us learn something about God. God cannot die. Death is foreign to God in the sense that God cannot die. We learn from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16, who only hath immortality. God is immortal. God cannot die. Whether it's God the Father or Jesus Christ before he became human. Let me say that again. Before he became human, because Christ was both human and divine. Divinity, that's a, perhaps a better word to use, cannot die. I say it one more time. Divinity, and that will include Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, cannot die. Let us learn something else about divinity or about God. James chapter 1 from verse 13. Let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. God cannot be tempted. Two things. God cannot die. Or let me say divinity cannot die. Point number two, divinity or God cannot be tempted. By the way, nor does he tempt anyone. God never tempts anyone to sin. So we have a God, God of heaven and earth, who cannot die and who cannot be tempted. But in devising the plan of salvation, God had to find a way to experience death and temptation. Let me say that again. In devising the plan of salvation, God, the Father, God, the Son, 
as they worked on this plan, the Holy Spirit as well, because the Godhead functions as one. They had to find a way for Christ, who was God, to experience death and to experience temptation. In other words, God had to develop a situation in which he would experience something that was absolutely foreign to him. And those things were death and temptation, or in the other order, temptation and death. The answer to that was to come as a human being. Not a human being in the condition of Adam before he sinned, but to come as a human being in the condition of Adam after he sinned, God developed a way to take upon him fallen, weak, frail human nature with all its weaknesses. When by weaknesses, I mean its capacity to sin. And so Christ, God the Son, became human. Tremendous humiliation that you nor I will ever fully understand the mighty God who is so big, we discovered that the universe cannot contain him. He found a way to become one of us. Why? That he might experience temptation. Why? That he might experience death. Why? That he might pay the price for sin. The Bible calls God the living God. John 8, 57. As the living father have sent me. That's how Jesus called him. Paul refers to him in 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. We are the temple of the living. He is the living God. God himself is life. Eloise says God has given his life to the trees and vines of his creation. Every animal lives because God gives that animal life. Every tree lives because God gives life to that tree. God does not give death. God gives life. Now, why would God agree? to make him put himself in a position where he could experience death. The reason for that is sin, not sin that Christ committed, but sin that was committed. The Bible says, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. We know from Romans 6, 26, the wages of sin is death. We know from uh, Ezekiel 18, verse 4 and verse 20, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. We know from Romans 5, verse 12, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for because, in, because that all men have sinned. Wherever there's death, there is sin. Without sin, there cannot be death. Jesus Christ, who was God, still is, by the way, but who agreed to take our condition, he subjected himself to that humiliation because of sin. In order to pay the price, that fallen mankind may have a way to be redeemed. Let me pray again before I continue. Father in heaven, continue to instruct me as I speak to your beloved people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. What is sin? 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, Whosoever transgresseth the law, sinneth, transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Our subject is the cause of war. The Bible says sin is the transgression of the law. Now let me tell you very clearly, everything that exists, exists because of law. Whether it's a living human being intelligent like mankind, a living human being that is not intelligent as we are, uh, animals, plant life, even inanimate things, whether it's a rock or everything that exists is governed by law. And if you are uh, a scientist, you understand that. You understand that matter is governed by law, whether it's liquid, solid, or gas, all matter is governed by law, and that law proceeds from God himself. Sin is a violation of the law of God, and that violation extends from the moral law, the Ten Commandments, but it has repercussions at every level of existence. Let me say that again. When we sin, we not only violate the Ten Commandments, but the Ten Commandments are the source of which 
all of the laws flow. Why? Because the Ten Commandments are the expression of the very nature and righteousness of God. And so Ella White tells us in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 52, paragraph 3, the law of God is as sacred as God himself. I repeat, the law of God is as sacred as God himself. So when we sin, <coughs> excuse me, we actually offend directly and personally against God. And so when Potiphar's wife tried to seduce Joseph to commit uh, adultery, Joseph said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Genesis 39, 7 to 9. Sin is an offense directly against God. When David prayed in Psalm 51, confessing his sin of adultery and murder with Uriah's wife, the lady called Bathsheba, he said, against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Sin is a personal offense against a personal God. There's no impersonal sin. All sin is an attack against God because the law of God is as sacred as God himself. Why? The law is holy. The law is just. The law is good. The law, as Romans 7 verse 12, the law is perfect. Uh, the, Psalm 19 verse 7, and God is all those things. The sin, which is a violation of God's law, is an attack against God himself. Now, speaking about attack against God himself, and our subject is the cause of war, let us go to Revelation chapter 12. We'll read from verse 7. You know this passage very well. Revelation 12, reading from verse 7, our subject, the cause of war. The Bible says, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels, that's Christ, fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. Those who oppose God have no right to reside in heaven. And those of us who persist in living in sin, we shall never be taken to heaven. The same way living beings who oppose God in heaven were cast out. Living beings who oppose God on earth will never enter heaven. I hope I said that clearly. Let me say it again by reading the Bible again. Revelation 12, reading from verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels, Michael is Christ, fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels, the dragon is Satan, made very clear in verse 9 of that same chapter, Revelation 12. Nigh and they prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. Because they attacked God, because they sinned against God, they were thrown out of heaven. Those of us on earth who persistently sin against God, we will never enter heaven the same way those in heaven who attacked God were thrown out. Heaven is not a place for lawbreakers. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. Verse 9, Revelation 12. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. There was a war. Now, what was the basis, the foundation of that war? To understand the cause of the war, we need to understand what mysteriously developed in the mind of Lucifer before he became Satan. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 14. We shall read from verse 13. Isaiah 14, reading from verse 13. Or let's read from 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which this weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Somehow, mysteriously, in a way the Bible does not explain, a desire developed in Lucifer to take God's place. Keep in mind, Lucifer was a created being. No created being can be God. 
because God is not created. God creates. God is not created. God the Father is not created. God the Son is not created. God the Holy Spirit is not created. They are not created. They are all involved in creation, but they themselves are not created. A created being cannot qualify as God. As a matter of fact, you don't qualify as God. You're either just God or you're not. God has always been God. He has always been there. Lucifer, as I said, in some mysterious way, not explained in the Bible, he tried to take God's place. And to take God's place, he would have to remove God. Well, in his own mind, he thought he would take God's place. That's why the war broke up. Verse 15 says, yet thou shalt be cast down to hell, to the size of the pit. That's what is done to sinners. Lucifer, therefore, sinned against God by desiring God's position. Let me say very quickly, you and I must desire God's character, not God's position. That's Lucifer's mistake. Lucifer wanted God's position, not God's character. You and I must desire the character of God, and that character is in the person of Jesus Christ. We're not to desire the place of God. We are to desire the character of God. We are to desire the righteousness of God, the holiness of God, the forgiving nature of God, the long-suffering nature of God, the patience of God, the goodness of God. We must desire that. We must never desire to take God's place. The cause of war is our subject. Listen to what Jesus Christ had to say about Lucifer or Satan. Let's go to John chapter 8. We'll read verse 44. Now, Jesus who walked on the earth was the Jesus who fought Satan long time ago. And so they knew each other because, as a matter of fact, Lucifer was created by Christ. I never said Satan. I said Lucifer, the, the Lucifer, the perfect being, was made by Christ. The Bible tells us in Ezekiel 28, verse 13, verse 15, that Lucifer was created, and the active creator is Jesus Christ. John 8, reading verse 44, I was subject, the cause of war. Let me pray again. Father, continue to tell me what to tell your people, and help me to say it as simply as I can. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Listen to what Christ told the scribes and Pharisees. Ye are of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Now, Christ accused the devil of two things in that verse. Let's read the verse again. Let's read it microscopically, our subject, the cause of war. Ye are of your father, the devil, by the way. God is not the father of everyone. Jesus is very clear. You are of your father, the devil. Those who knowingly, and I use the word carefully, consciously, deliberately, intentionally, and flagrantly violate God's law, make themselves children of Satan, not children of God. Ye are of your father, the devil. And the lusts of your father you will do. Now, listen carefully. He was a murderer from the beginning. That's violation of commandment six, thou shalt not kill. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar. That's violation of commandment nine, thou shalt not bear false witness. It is also a violation of commandment three, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You claim to be a Christian, you live differently, that's a lie. Lucifer broke the law of God. He was a murderer, he was a liar, and based on James chapter 2, verse 10, whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. This created being called Lucifer broke the law of God and he had to be thrown out. And the wages of sin is death. And we know from 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, he that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. And the wages of sin is death. Lucifer, who became Satan, he sinned by violating the law of God. The angels who followed him, they violated the law of God. When Adam sinned, he violated the law of God. 
Why are there still some angels in heaven that were not thrown out? Because they obeyed and obeyed the law of God. Go with me to Psalm 103. We shall read verse 20. Psalm 103, verse 20, our subject, the cause of war. And the cause of war was sin. And we have discovered that sin is the violation of the law of God. And so the cause of war was the law of God. Psalm 103, verse 20. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that is selling strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Do his commandments, that statement, and hearkening unto the voice of his word are the same thing. To give you a fancy expression, that may be called Hebrew parallelism. Parallel lines run together. Hark, do his commandments, that's one line. Hearkening unto his word, another line. They are saying the same thing. Another example. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. Same thing. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, it stood fast. Same thing. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, they obey God. Hearkening unto the voice of his words. Same thing. The word of God is the commandment of God. The angels that remained in heaven, they remained because they obeyed God. Those who were thrown out were thrown out because they disobeyed God. Let me tell you something now about the law of God. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 49, paragraph 1. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 49, paragraph 1. God placed man under law. By the way, based on Psalm 103, verse 20, he had previously placed the angels under law. God placed man under law. It wasn't Adam's choice. Adam was made under law. God placed man under law. So we were made to obey law. And the only way to please God is to live an obedient life. God placed man under law as, a, as an indispensable condition of his very existence. Nothing can exist without law. Listen again. God placed man under law as an indispensable condition of his very existence. Let me give you a personal example of law. Right now, you are breathing. You're breathing in oxygen, so am I. You're expelling carbon dioxide. It's poisonous. We don't want it staying in the body. How does that happen? There are laws that allow the oxygen in the lungs to diffuse into the bloodstream. There's a law that allows the carbon monoxide in the blood to diffuse into the lungs to be expelled. There are laws, and those laws are sophisticated. They're somehow connected with atmospheric pressure. It is very complex. It all functions by law. Violation of law is an attack upon the universal system. Yes, let me say it again. One little human being, by sinning, in that sin has launched an attack against the universal system of God. Because God's arrangement was everything would function by law. Every violation of God's law is an attack against the system that God set up. And so Satan, when he attacked God, his object was to overthrow the law of God. But to show you how suicidal sin is, by overthrowing God's law, by attacking God's law, Satan put his life in danger because one day he will surely die, he'll perish. Sin is so suicidal, sin does not allow the sinner to realize that sin, disobedience to God's law, is suicide. Because there is no life without law. Romans 7 verse 10, the law which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Why? When we disobey the law of life, the punishment is death. Satan attacked the law of God. He was thrown out because God's law is a secret of God himself. And to attack the law is to attack God. I'll tell you something else about the law of God. We live in a world of biblical error. 
I don't say we live in a world where the Bible has errors. We live in a world of biblical error in the sense people misunderstand the Bible and they preach error. And two of the biggest errors are that when you die, you go to heaven or hell immediately, your soul remains alive. The second big error is that the Sabbath is Sunday. Those are two massive errors, errors which most of the world follows, but they are not biblical at all. Now, I told you, let's learn something else about the law. Signs of the Times, April 30, 1896, paragraph one. Signs of the Times, April 30, 1896, paragraph one. The doctrine which is to test, the, the standard which is to test every doctrine, every theory, every profession is the law of God. The standard which is to test every doctrine, every theory, every profession is the law of, in other words, anyone who preaches and that sermon minimizes God's law, that sermon needs to be avoided. I am not proclaiming legalism because the law does not preach legalism. The law expresses righteousness and righteousness is not legalism. The law expresses righteousness, which is a very character of God. That's why the law is as sacred as God himself. And I say again, any sermon, any presentation that minimizes the law of God ought to be avoided because Christ, who was God and still is, Christ, who was divine and still is, while he's also human, he subjected himself to be human in his fallen condition. He subjected himself to hunger, to thirst, to pain, to abuse. He subjected himself to suffer temptation. He voluntarily subjected himself to death. Why? Because the law was broken. And so to minimize the law of God is to minimize the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Nellowai tells us in Last Day Events, page 43, paragraph 3, God has a people, a distinct people, a church on earth, second to none, superior to all in the facilities to teach, to, to teach the, the truth and to vindicate the law of God. God. She's telling us God has a people on this earth, and I believe you are part of that people, to teach truth. And truth is only truth if it is consistent with the law of God. Let me say that again. Truth is only truth if it is consistent with the law of God. You may say, no, truth is truth if it is consistent with the life of Christ. But the life of Christ was consistent with the law of God. That's why, but now the righteousness of Christ, apart from the law, is, is, is manifested, being witnessed by the law. The righteousness of Christ's life is supported by the law of God because the law of God is the standard by which he measures righteousness, by which he measures truth and error. The law of God, any attack against God's law is an attack against God. And God has a people on this earth to vindicate his law because law is life. Let me say it again. Law is life. The law points out to the sinner his transgression, but it does not make a way out. While it promises life to the obedient, it declares that death is the portion of the transgressor. Great Controversy, page 476, 467, paragraph 3. The law reveals to man his transgression, but provides no remedy. While it promises life to the obedient, it declares that death is the portion of the transgressor of the disobedient. The law of God, its original purpose is life. It still is. That's why Paul says, no, ye not. That to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, of obedience unto righteousness. The law of God is a law of life. Sin entered, and the law had to condemn sin, and the punishment for sin is death. Now, let's take that a look at that, but let me pray again. Father, as I continue, and I'm not far from finishing God, but you continue to speak through me in Jesus' name. Amen. The law declares that the punishment for violating it is death. That tells you how serious God is against his law, that God's response to any attack on his law is death. 
and by death I mean a death from which there is no return. That's how serious God is about his law. Violation of God's law is not punished by two weeks in prison or by fining you $30,000. God's punishment for violating the law is death. When I say death, I mean the second death from which there's no return. How Christ came back from it is a mystery we'll study forever because he paid the price. The cause of war, the law of God. <clears throat> Great controversy, <clears throat> excuse me, page 582, paragraph one. Great controversy, page 582, paragraph one. I just checked the time. I have a few minutes left. For, for, listen very carefully. From the very beginning of the great controversy in heaven, the strife between Satan and uh, uh, Lucifer and Christ, it has been Satan's purpose to overthrow the law of God. It was to accomplish this that he entered upon his rebellion against the creator. <clears throat> and though he was cast out of heaven, he has continued the same warfare upon the earth. My little brother, my little sister, let me talk to you while the adults eavesdrop. When you disobey your parents, you are doing what the devil wants you to do. It is the devil who gets you to disobey your parent because the devil wants to destroy you. The devil knows that the law says, honor thy father and thy mother. When you disobey the lawful words of your parents, and I say lawful because I've met some children who told me their parents wanted them to study on Sabbath and their parents wanted them to work on the Sabbath. You cannot do that. And so when you disobey the lawful words of your parents, you are cooperating with the devil, my little brother. You are cooperating with the devil, my little sister. Obey your parents. Why? Because you're living in harmony with God's law. The punishment for law breaking is death. That person must cease to exist forever. That's how serious God is about his law. The Bible calls it the punishment, the second death. That's the death that all stubborn sinners who refuse to submit to God will finally suffer. And from that death, there is no return. The cause of war, the law of God. Let me give you that quotation again. Great Controversy, page 582, paragraph 1. From the very beginning of the great controversy in heaven, it has been certain's purpose to overthrow the law of God. It was to accomplish this that he entered upon his rebellion against the creator. And though he was cast out of heaven, he has continued the same warfare upon the earth. Violation of God's law. That's why we live in a world of murder and all kinds of crime and disease and disaster and war. And all, because the law of God is persistently violated. Persistently violated. Because Satan knows Violation leads to death, and he wants to kill you. And so Jesus warns us in John seven, in John 10, verse 10. John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's it. I am come, says Christ, that they might have life. Satan brings death. Christ brings life. I am come, that they might have life. And they that might have it more abundantly. In Proverbs 8, verse 36, wisdom is used as a symbolic expression of Christ. And in that verse we read, all they that hate me love death. All they that hate me love death. And how do we show hatred for Christ? Listen to the second commandment. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, <clears throat> am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, <clears throat> excuse me, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And how do you hate God? Listen to the second part of that expression, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Notice that those who love God keep his commandments. Well, then how do we hate God? We disobey his commandments. And so the Bible says, all they that hate me love death, Proverbs 8.36. How do we hate God? 
we violate his commandments. How does Satan express his hatred for God? He violated, he attacked the commandments of God. When you and I disobey God, that act of disobedience is an act of hatred towards God. Even a child of God in an individual act of rebellion against God's law is expressing hatred for God in that moment of rebellion. The only way to love God, and you know the verse, John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. There is no other way to love God. And so in order to move or remove the angel's love for God, Satan had to attack the very means by which they demonstrated that love. And that means was the law of God. My listening friend, we are saved by the sacrifice of Christ. But keep this in mind. The only reason why Christ died is because the law of God was violated. It was broken. And the law of God is so sacred that someone equal with God himself, Jesus Christ, had to come and die. Many people use Christ's sacrifice to say he did away with the law. They do not understand. It is the very opposite. The death of Christ demonstrates how much God's law means to him. Let me check the time. I don't want to hold you very long. Give me five or ten more minutes. In the construction, let me pray again. Father, as I come to the conclusion, give me the right words, God, please. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Several the Adventists, we have an advantage no other church has. Not that the advantage is not available to other churches. They simply do not use it. The advantage is the sanctuary service. By studying the sanctuary service, we learn about the dealings of God with sin and with sinners and how God makes salvation available and how he sanctifies, justifies, perfects, and ultimately saves and what he does with sin. Now, in the construction of the sanctuary, God told Moses the very first thing to make was the ark. Exodus 25, reading from verse 10, the very first thing to be made was the ark. And we know there were several articles of furniture and instruments associated with the services of the sanctuary. The number one, the one made first was the ark. The ark was a sacred container. It contained the law of God. Eloi tells us in the great controversy, page 433, paragraph two, the ark was merely a receptacle for the precepts of God's law or for the tables of this, the law. And the presence of these divine precepts gave to it its sacredness and value. It is only because the law was in that box that that box became untouchable. The box itself had no value outside of the law. So the ark was untouchable. Anyone who touched it died. Because it simply meant by touching the ark, you're touching God's law. Take your hands off God's law. The punishment was death. So the Israelites were taught, do not touch God's law. In a sense, don't violate God's law. Where was that ark placed? In the sanctuary, we have the outer court where the animals were killed. We have the holy place. We have the most holy. God placed his law in the most holy place. And the ark was the only article of furniture in the most holy place. It contained the ark. What does that tell you? God could have placed his law in the outer court. He could have placed his law in the holy place. He placed it in the most holy because the law of God means everything to God. And the Israelites had to understand the sacredness of God's law. The high priest could not enter the most holy place with one sin on his life. If he did, he dropped dead. He came into the holy place many times a day. He could only enter the most holy once a year. And he had to be sinless. Why? He came into the presence of God's law, which in a very real sense is the very presence of God. And that ark represented the throne of God, which means the throne of God is propped up by the law of God. Let me say it differently. The foundation of God's throne is the law of God. Let's go back to Patriarchs and Prophets, page 49, paragraph 2. God placed man under law as an indispensable condition of his very existence. He was made a subject of the divine government, and there can be no government without law. The universal government of God is based on the law of God, as expressed in the Ten Commandments. Let me say it again. The universal government of God is based on the law of God. 
Satan wanted to overthrow God's government. The only way he could do that would be to overthrow the law of God. The cause of war, the law of God. You and I are coming close and quickly to the end times. What will be the issue of contention? The law of God. It will be uh, concentrated in, in, the, in the fact that we will have a choice. We accept Sunday as a Sabbath, which will be a, come a law. We know that, the Sunday law. Or we continue to obey God the seventh day as a Sabbath. The final conflict will come down on this one point. Will I obey the laws of man or the law of God? I pray and hope that you will always keep in mind that the law of God is the standard for the universe. And any request, any demand, any command from a non-divine source that requires us to obey, to disobey God's law must be avoided. And so you and I don't take exams on Sabbath because God tells us it's a holy day. You and I don't go to the Hyderabad cricket ground to watch uh, uh, Sachin Tendulkar bat because that is a holy day. We do it, we obey because God's law is holy and it expresses the will of God, the will of God for the universe, the will of God for this earth, the will of God for your personal little world is a life of compliance with the law of God. I'll give you one more quotation and I pray. Signs of the Times, September 24, 1894, paragraph four. Signs of the Times, September 24, 1894, Paragraph four, let me pray. Father, I'm about to end. Continue to bless me with clear words. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> it is the prerogative of God alone to prescribe the duty of men and angels. The will of God is a perfect will and must be obeyed as it is set forth in his holy law. Because every requirement is just and is set forth by infinite wisdom. The law of God should be obeyed even though there were no authority to enforce it and no rewards for its obedience. The highest interests of men and angels are conserved in obeying the law of God. God's will expressed in his law is the supreme will and no invention, no device of men can take its place. Obedience to the commandments of men instead of the commandments of God will be as abomination in the sight of God. For what God requires is essential to the highest good of his subject and is therefore essential for the glory of God. Let me focus on the end of that quotation. When you and I obey the law of God, the person who ultimately benefits is God. And he benefits in the sense that he is glorified because he can point to Satan and say, look, I have a child who perfectly obeyed my, obeys my law, even though Satan had accused God of having a law that no one could keep. When you and I obey God's law, we glorify God, we vindicate God in our life. God is glorified and vindicated. That's why, you know, God said to Satan about Job, hast thou considered my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man. One that feareth God and escheweth evil. God told Lucifer, Satan, look at Job. He obeys me. God wants to say to the devil, look at this person in Hyderabad or wherever you're listening from. That person obeys me. My law is fulfilled in that person. Look at that person. Look at that man. Look at that woman. Look at that young boy. Look at that little girl. They obey me. The cause of war, the law of God. Satan tried to destroy it. But God's law is as sacred as God himself, and the righteousness of God cannot be destroyed. The law of God will never be destroyed. Psalm 11, verse 7, the works of his hands are verity and judgment. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever. And those who obey God through the power of Christ will one day live forever and ever in a world where from every new moon to another, and from every Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. In other words, we shall live in the new world where the law of God will be the standard for every created intelligent being, humans, those in unfallen worlds, and angelic beings. The cause of war, the law of God. When you and I violate God's law, we cooperate with Satan. When we, through the power of Christ, obey God's law, we cooperate with God. 
choose right now to live a life of cooperation with God by living an obedient life through the power of Jesus Christ who lived as you live, who conquered sin, who died voluntarily, who came from the grave by his own power, and who gives you and me that same power to live an obedient life. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the law. It is a law of love, which means that truly love is obedience from the heart. I pray, Father, my words were understood. If not, let the Spirit now work on the minds of those who heard to clarify my weak statements, dear God. Put a double blessing on all the little boys, little girls. Let them understand that you expect them to obey you. Even as the little Jesus as a boy obeyed, John the Baptist as a little boy, he obeyed. Josiah at eight years old, he obeyed you, Father. Teach my little brothers and sisters that they can obey you. For those listening who are not Adventists, bless them in a very special way. Bless every country, Father. Heal the sick, dear God. Heal the sick and guide the minds of the leaders of the countries that their decisions may allow the gospel to go forward. But Father, the host country of India pour out a special blessing upon them and the host church pour out an extra special blessing upon them, I pray. Bring us back tomorrow, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.